Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, it's not Sabbath here yet, but it will be not too long. And um, we're going to continue this study on the third angel's messages of righteousness by faith. And we've been going through this history of, of the message of righteousness by faith. But we've spent a lot of time reading A.T. Jones' articles. And uh, these are his sermons, actually, from the 1893 and 1895 General Conference bulletins that we've read. It's covered a lot of ground of the understanding of righteousness by faith and what was being presented in that history when Ellen White was definitely behind what A.T. Jones was doing. And um, we've seen that there is this parallel between uh, this history here in uh, 1890, well, 1888, 1892, and three, and 1895, as Jones is seeing a progression of um, this third angel's message in the context of Revelation 18, and that Revelation 18, the mighty angel has come down, has joined the third message, and what's going to happen is the message should be proclaimed with a loud cry. Now, one of the things about Jones that we're going to be looking at later is his discouragement with the failure of, let's say, his prediction, right? So, I mean, he didn't predict a specific date like we did with July 18, 2020. But definitely, as things progressed, they did not progress the way that they expected. And, of course, the main reason was God's people weren't doing the work that was given them to do. And so uh, we're going to see all that ugly history of what happened uh, basically uh, not long after this. Uh, we're, you know, we'll get into the history of 1901 to 1903, what happened with the general conferences there. And we will also see um, as we get to 1909, um, things that happened there, all these different uh, things that happened with Kellogg. And all these things are related to the understanding of righteousness by faith in that the church has taken a, a stand. Or it, it's a, they believe that we have actually accepted the message of righteousness by faith. And most Adventists who believe that, who believe in the third angel's message is the message of righteousness by faith and that the church has accepted it. And that um, the church's position is those is that Jones went off track. So this is George R. Knight, um, who's a revisionist historian in Adventism, and uh, in 1988 wrote a book called 1888 to Apostasy um, that tries to show that uh, all of this, you know, perfectionistic uh, last generation theology that exists within Adventism amongst conservatives is, is actually a distortion of the Third Angel's message. Of course, he's wrong. Because you can see here in this history, you can see what was being taught by Jones and that this was endorsed by Ellen White all through this history. Jones is going to uh, become discouraged because of the lack of interest in this message and all the infighting that goes on within Adventism at the turn of the century. Uh, so we are going to look at that history. But right now, what we have is two more uh, presentations uh, the Third Angel's Message, number 25 and 26, in the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. Anyway, before we get in to, to reading this and going through it, it's a rather long one, so I'm going to try to get through it quickly. I'll try to do the least amount of comments that I can. If we can't get through it, you know, because uh, I think it goes for like 20, 21 pages, um, which is almost twice as much as most of them. That we've done already it might i might have to do this one in two presentations but anyway before we begin can you join me in a word of prayer dear gracious heavenly father we are so thankful that we can be here uh, once again uh, uh, closing the six working days in a study as we open the sabbath we are grateful lord for uh, the light that we have had this past week, people who are watching these videos and uh, studying for themselves to understand what is truth. 
We know, Lord, the heart of this message is uh, the three angels' messages, which reveals uh, Christ's character in his people. And we just ask, Lord, that we can accept these truths as we study them, that we can understand them, and that you can help me as I lead out in this reading and discussion. Um, and that uh, people will have a blessing from it. Uh, be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jones uh, begins this. He says that we may have the subject, or rather the particular point of it, clearly before us. I will repeat a few expressions in the passages with which we closed last night's lesson. At the marriage of Cana, Jesus began his work of breaking down the exclusiveness which exist among, existed among the Jews. Their religion was a yoke of bondage. The miracle at the feast pointed directly toward the breaking down of the prejudice, prejudices of the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. Yet he mingled freely with the Samaritans, setting at naught the customs and bigotry of his nation. He had already begun to break down the partition wall between Jew and Gentile and preach the salvation to the world. They had felt that in order to prove themselves loyal to their nationality, it was incumbent upon them to cherish enmity toward the Samaritans. They were filled with wonder at the conduct of Jesus, who was breaking down the wall of separation between the Jews and Samaritans and openly setting aside the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees. During the two days while they shared the Lord's ministry in Samaria, fidelity to Christ kept their prejudices under control, and they would not fail to show reverence to him. But in, the, in heart, they were unreconciled, yet it was a lesson essential for them to learn. So this is a quote from Ellen White from the book Desire of Ages. Now, it is interesting because when we were studying the book of Ezekiel, we learned something about the Jewish hatred towards the Samaritans. Um, now, the Jews in Jerusalem, um, in the south, when northern Israel was carried away um, and scattered, and, the, and these people from these different places came in and mingled with the inhabitants that had remained in the land, which was not many, and then adopted the religion, as they saw it, of Israel, because you worship the local gods. That's the way most people would look at it. Um, and so that's where the Samaritans came from. And, and we find this in, in Ezra chapter 4, where it talks about uh, these people who say that, you know, we were carried here and we worship the same God. Can't we help in building the temple, right? But the Jews hated uh, the Samaritans and, of course, northern Israel. To them, this was a, a point of righteousness, that these people who had were involved in this false worship needed to be treated with contempt, to be shunned, to be outcasts. And so Christ, however doesn't see that as an option because he's seeking to win souls to him. And, and so the disciples, of course, here, according to Ellen White, you know, they, they keep their prejudices under control, uh, but that's because of their, uh, their love for Christ. Jesus did not come into the world to lessen the dignity of the law, but to exalt it. The Jews had perverted it by their prejudices and misconceptions. Their meanings, meaningless exactions and requirements had become a byword among the people of other nations. Especially was the Sabbath hedged in by all manner of senseless restrictions. It could not then be called a delight, the holy of the Lord and honorable, for the scribes and Pharisees had made its observance a galling yoke. A Jew was not allowed to light a fire upon the Sabbath or even light a candle on that day. The views of the people were so narrow that they had become slaves to their own useless regulations. The Sabbath, instead of being the blessing it was designed to be, had become a curse through the added re requirements of the Jews. The Jewish leaders were filled with spiritual pride. Their desire for the glorification of self manifested itself even in the service of the sanctuary, as repeated calamities and persecutions came upon them from their heathen enemies. The Jews returned to the strict observance of all the outward forms enjoined by the sacred law. 
Not satisfied with this, they made burdensome additions to these ceremonies. Their pride and bigotry led them to the narrowest interpretation of the requirements of God. As time passed, they gradually held themselves in with the traditions and customs of their ancestors till they regarded the requirements originating from men as possessing all the sanctity of the original law. This confidence in themselves and their own regulations with its attendant prejudices against all other nations caused them to resist the spirit of God. In all his lessons, Jesus presented to men the worthlessness of mere ceremonial obedience. The Jews had become earthly and they did not discern spiritual things. And so when Christ set before them the very truths that were the soul of all their service, they, looking only at the external, accused him of seeking to overthrow it. He knew that they would use these works of mercy as strong arguments to affect the minds of the masses, who had all their lives been bound by the Jewish restrictions and exactions. Nevertheless, he was not prevented by this knowledge from breaking down the senseless wall of superstition that barricaded the Sabbath. His act of mercy did honor to the day, while those who complained of him were by their many useless rites and ceremonies themselves dishonoring the Sabbath. The Jews accused, accused Christ of trampling upon the Sabbath when he was only seeking to restore it to its original character. The interpretations given to the law by the rabbis, all their minute and burdensome exactions were turning away the Sabbath uh, from its true object and giving to the world a false conception of the divine law and of the character of God. Their teachings virtually represented God as giving laws which it was impossible for the Jews, much less for any other people, to obey. Thus, in their earthliness, separated from God in spirit, while professedly serving him, they were doing just the work that Satan desired them to do, taking a course to impeach the character of God and cause the people to view him as a tyrant. To think that the observance of the Sabbath, as God required it, made man hard-hearted, unsympathetic, and cruel. Christ did not come to set aside what the patriarchs and prophets had spoken, for he himself had spoken through these representative men. He himself was the originator of all truth. Every jewel of truth came from Christ. But those priceless gems had been placed in false settings. Their precious light had been made to minister to error. Men had taken them to adorn tradition and superstition. Jesus came to take them out of the false settings of error and put them into the framework of truth. So the framework of truth, um, I think, you know, obviously uh, this framework is not well understood by many religionists. Uh, that is, this, this problem exists in our day in various different ways, in various different beliefs and so forth. But anyway, what could more fully express the thought of the form of godliness without the power than do those people and their services in that day. Can you imagine? Every one of these statements is simply another way of stating the truth. So this is Jones now. Uh, that they had a form of godliness without the power, right? And the question we have to ask ourselves, is that true of us? Do we just have a form of godliness? Are we just trying to use the law to look good, at least on the outside. Now we are in the time of the world's history when the same thing, the form of godliness without the power, is cursing the world. And the same truths that were written in the scriptures against the thing, that thing in that day, are the light and truth of Jesus Christ against that thing in this day. The same thing that saved the people from the form of godliness without the power in that day, the same thing that saved the people from the senseless round of forms and ceremonies of ceremonialism and the ceremonial law, which is simply ceremonialism. The same thing that saved the people from that in that day is to save the people from that in this day. What saved the people from this day, from this thing in that day? He is our peace, who hath made both one. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, contained in ceremonies, contained in forms without the power. For to make in himself of twain 
one new man, so making peace. It was an absolute surrender to Jesus Christ of every interest in the universe, and thus finding in him the destruction of the enmity in that day that saved people from ceremonialism. Nothing short of that will save people from ceremonialism in this day. Nothing short of that will save Seventh-day Adventists from ceremonialism and from following the same track of the old ceremonial law. Now, we know that within Adventism, there is this confusion within Christianity about the ceremonial law. Now, we know the ceremonial law, the ordinances, the commandments contained in ordinances. These things were to show us a type of what was to come, that the blood of bulls and goats themselves could not take away sin. They could not make a person perfect uh, as pertaining to the conscious, 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 uh, conscience, right? So you, they couldn't remove sins from the mind, from the memory. They couldn't blot out sins. They couldn't change the heart. Every person who has ever been saved throughout eternity has been saved not by the old covenant, but by the new covenant. Nobody was ever saved by the old covenant. They always were saved by the new. That is, through the old covenant, they could see the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. They had to trust in a savior. But if they trusted just in their own actions of offering an offering, which, of course, no offering could be give, given for known sin. David could not give an offering for murder and adultery. He says if. There was an offering I could give, then I would give it. But all God requires is a broken and a contrite spirit. That God will not despise. So anyway, uh, Prescott is going to ask, ask a question or make a comment here. He says, I would like to know if we can get, if we get the thought clearly, because it all seems to center right there. Are we uh, to understand that thought that Jesus Christ did at that time really abolish not simply the ceremonial law, but that he did a great deal more than that, that he abolished ceremonial law everywhere and always, no matter how expressed. Yes, sir. That is the point exactly. Now, the thing is, ceremonial law everywhere and always has never been able to save. Um, so I think there is much more than even what Prescott is talking about, that Christ abolished in his flesh, the enmity, because the enmity is not so if we go back and look at this sentence, so let's let's go look at this a bit more. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to switch to the Bible here. <clears throat> so this is. Because this, these are the passages that Jones is uh, studying, right? So he's gone through Ephesians uh, chapter 2. So I'm just going to read back to, to starting at verse 1 here. And you hath he quickened, <coughs> who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. Conversation means the matter of life. So we've all lived that way in times past. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace that ye are saved. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, one of the things that Joe Jones has shown is that this, through these studies, is that this Ephesians chapter 2, talking about in Christ, that we are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that we are only here as ambassadors, 
but in Christ, our humanity has been elevated to heaven. And, and this is the work that Christ has done in connecting humanity and divinity. Um, so he says, um, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that up not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, right? Um, so he's writing to people who are Gentiles, right? I would think that means those are, those are people who are actually Gentiles, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, the Jews. you got Jews and Gentiles. At that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So here he's saying that the Gentiles now are brought into this covenant with God that the Jews are in. Now, the Jews, of course, they're not really following this covenant, but just in this idealistic sense. For he is our peace who hath made both one, and it's broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so make him peace. So if you look at what he's talking about, the context here, he's not talking about the ceremonial law that the Jews were observing, that this was the thing that was uh, the enmity, right? Because the question is, what is the enmity here? Because it says, having abolished in his flesh, the enmity... And then it says, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. But are Gentiles observing the Jewish law? They're not, right? No, no they're so not. That, yeah, so that's not the thing that's, that's creating this wall of partition. It's not the ceremonial law that, that needs to be removed in order to unite them. So when he talks about uh, the enmity, even the law of commandments containing ordinances. This must mean something more than just the removing of uh, the ceremonial law, abolishing the ceremonial law. So I'm not quite sure. That, now, Prescott is saying, well, it contains, it's more than that. But I think it's something else. I don't think this law of commandments contained in ordinances is just referring to the, the old covenant law that was given to the Jews. What are, what are you thinking? Well, okay. So if we take this, that this means that Christ just got rid of the, the offerings so that the Gentiles now could fellowship with the Jews, then that would mean that there was something wrong with these commandments you know, the, the ceremonial law that God gave to the Jews because it was not meant to create uh, enmity between Jew and Gentile, right? That's not why it was given. It was to point forward to Christ. But it was misused, right? So, but I'm not even sure if that's what it's even talking about here. There must be something more in the context here that we're missing out on. Now we know there's the circumcision and uncircumcision. So we can say, well, circumcision is part of the ceremonial law. And that creates a, a partition wall between Jew and Gentile because Gentiles are uncircumcised and Jews are circumcised. So Christ is going to get rid of that distinction. But Christ put that distinction there, right? He told Abraham to circumcise himself and his sons right and and that practice of circumcision carried on it was it was necessary it was part of what god required and so i don't think that that's what it can be talking about is the removing of something that god put there 
um, even though that we understand we don't practice the ceremonial law, but it must be something else. And I, I don't have the answer to your question is, what is it? Um, there must be something more here to this than how it comes across uh, in the King James and how it's been translated. Um, now, when we look at the Greek here, so I'm just gonna, um, so we have uh, the word uh, commandments is just injunction. That is a prescription. Um, and then ordinances here refer to civil, ceremonial, or ecclesiastical decrees or ordinances. And I would think that this, that, so this must encompass something that's, at least it's more than just the ceremonial law. But I think it's even primarily more than the ceremonial law. It's not like the ceremonial law, it also includes these other things. I think it's this other thing but would also include a misuse of the ceremonial law. But this is just man's, it's the way that he's describing uh, man's attempts to, uh, to make up for the fact that we're sinners. Because Christ abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now the enmity we would know, what is the enmity? Because here it just says even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, but it can't just mean that. Well, the enmity of the law. So we will... Okay, well, it's the enmity between, uh, remember that the first time we get enmity mentioned is in Genesis chapter 3, right? In the gospel promise. Um, I will put enmity yes. between the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel, right? So this enmity is between the serpent and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And we can see that it's going to be manifest in the cross. It's going to result in the cross. Now, we also have, so if we look up enmity, I'm just going to look up all the places this is. Um, so, I mean, the ones that matter. Um, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can, it can be. So what must be talking about is something similar to this, that Christ removed, this enmity that exists in the carnal mind. Because it's not something that exists, it's not, it's not a characteristic of the ceremonial law that it's, it's enmity, right? There's nothing about the ceremonial law that puts us at enmity with God. I mean, it's meant to show us our need of God, but it doesn't put us at enmity with God. The removing of the ceremonial law doesn't remove this enmity, right? So uh, so then we have Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. And, and then it says in verse 16, so I'm just going to go back there, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So this enmity, I don't, I don't know if that's a good translation where it says, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Uh, I think there's something there that doesn't make sense to me. At least I could be wrong, but I just don't think it, it, it makes sense to say that the enmity is the ceremonial law. I, I don't think that this verse can be saying. Maybe it's part of it, or whatever it is. Well, the ceremonial law doesn't have enmity in it. It's it's all about reconciling man to God. It's it's pointing forward to Christ. It itself is not. Now we can say that all these uh, additions made to the to this ceremonial law, those themselves are part of that enmity. So all the extra laws the Jews made to make the law even more burdensome, that could be included. That would in probably that. be that would probably be more likely. Yeah, 
But to say that the ceremonial its law itself is somehow the enmity doesn't make sense in the context of what's being talked about here. That this enmity must be something something else. Now I know there was a uh, a verse I was looking for last time. Uh, I couldn't, um, there's something about to the effect that you would not do the things that you would or something like that, but I, I couldn't find it. That would be, that would be in, in Romans 7. Okay, so you're what saying, in, okay, so where is that? Um, I'll have to look it up myself, but what, what's coming to me is First John 3, 12, uh, where it Cain slew his brother because his brother's works were righteous, but his were evil because he wanted to perform the works of the law by according to his standard instead of God's. Right. And so, I mean, I think that's that's obviously abolished by the cross. Man's attempt right. to save himself are removed by the cross. And you could include that in the enmity. I just have problems saying that the ceremonial law is is some bad thing that had to be removed because it's put there by God to point forward to Christ. It in and of itself is not some bad thing or some burden, right? We know that it 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 can't save anyone, but God gave the ceremonial law. It's not something created by man. So I think we sort of conflate the two. We conflate, you know, God's ceremonial law with all of the additions that were made by the Jews as if there was something wrong with the ceremonial law itself. But there isn't something wrong with the ceremonial law. It can't save us. So I guess there's something that, that is wrong with it in that sense. But it was given by God. So so God gave yeah, it I think you're looking... Right. And, excuse me. I think you're looking for Romans 7.18. 7, Isn't that interesting? It's 7.18. <laughs> yeah, for I know yeah. that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Yeah, you're not going to find it within yourself. Yeah, but there is another verse that says that you would not do the things that you would, but the things that you would do are actually sin. It's talking about something that God puts in our heart that changes us. And I, I just can never remember the word. Um, Romans 7 also. Um, yeah, but it, it's, yeah, but there's another one that says, um, I wish I could remember how it goes. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to, I, I've tried looking for it. I can never find it, but just because I have the wrong wording in my mind. Um, but anyway, so there is a text, though, that says that God puts something in us so that we will not sin, right? That you would not do what you wanted to do or what, what you would do. But I just, it, it, it doesn't say it in that way. But it, Probably it, First John 3, I think it is. Well, well, there is in, in 1 John chapter 3. There is this set uh, part where it says, um, maybe I can find it through that way. Um, it's John 3, 9. Well, who saw, who saw yeah. Who's born of Yeah, does not commit sin yeah. for his sin remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. So it's that idea, but expressed in a different way. Um, let me see. Uh, um we got Matthew 7, 18, but uh, that's not it. Um, just looking through the... Uh, first oh, here it is. Galatians 5, 7, Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh lust is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Wow. And these are contrary, the one to the other, 
so that she cannot do the things that she would. So this, people often interpret this verse to mean um, the things that you would do are, are good things, but it's actually showing that the spirit can conquer the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would. Because it says, but if ye be led by the spirit of God, ye are not under the law. That is, you're not under its condemnation. And you're not under its condemnation because you are keeping the law. So, and it, before that it says, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? Does that make sense now? What I'm talking about here? Yeah, so I've experienced that a few times. <laughs> oh, my flesh wanted to do something and which would have been horrible. And, and the Lord was just telling me, no, you're going to do the opposite. You're going to keep silence. You're going to do this person's laundry. You are not going to engage in a fight with her. <laughs> I remember that very well. <laughs> yeah, And so, you know, if we yield to God's spirit, we can trust that God is going to do this work in us. That, you know, often we focus at the inability of man to be righteous because we can't be righteous in and of ourselves. But God can work in us so that we would not do the things that we would. Right. He can change our hearts. And 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 that's something that that God does. It's not something that we manufacture. That we, we somehow become good. We are always sinners. The thing that I could uh, relate to this, this isn't my experience, but I've heard many testimonies of people who were alcoholics, who when they became Christians, never had again a desire to drink. That God just, Amen. that God just as a miracle took away that temptation. It doesn't happen with everyone, but with some people, um, who are, you know, steeped in either drugs or alcohol. God can just remove that. And and that's because they are so weak. I'm one of those people. <laughs> yeah. They are so weak that there is no way they can win that battle. So God, in a sense, wins that battle for them. Doesn't mean that every that there's no more struggle against any other thing. But but those things are sometimes so destructive that um that person could never rise above it unless God just performed a miracle on their behalf and took that away. But, but anyway, that's, <clears throat> I, I'm saying that what has to be taken away is that the enmity, that mind of the flesh, that's what has to be taken out of the way. So somewhere in that Ephesians statement to me in Ephesians chapter two, verse 15, it has to be talking not just about the ceremonial of it, something else. And and because it's talking about the enmity. And it says, even the law of commandments contained in orders. Well, that even is an added word. Okay. So what it might be saying is that it takes away the enmity. The law of commandments contained in ordinances is part of what takes away the enmity not the enmity itself. Because the law, of, if, if we go back to that verse, and, and I'm just I'm just trying to understand it, but if we look at, all, at the whole context, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, and if we say he did this through the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, that is, through fulfilling the law, that was pointing forward to Christ for to make in himself twain one new man, so making peace, reconciling both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So the enmity has to be that enmity that Paul talks about in other places. It can't be the enmity of the ceremonial law. And so so I wouldn't I wouldn't put that word even there. I would say maybe through the fulfilling of the commandments contained in God's ordinances. That might make more sense. But that's just me thinking, right? Whether that's the correct way to understand this verse or not, I don't know. I wouldn't, you know. But 
I know that there's something wrong with the verse if it's saying that what, what the enmity is, is the ceremonial law. Because Christ came and fulfilled the ceremonial law. And, and he didn't abolish the ceremonial law. He fulfilled it. I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them, right? Right. So, so to me, it makes no sense to say he abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Because that's not what he's doing. He's fulfilling it, not abolishing it. So, but that's my thoughts. You know, I could be wrong. It's just how I would understand that first. And so that, that part there in, uh, in Joan's presentation with Prescott there, I've always had a problem with it. It seemed to me not to be correct. But anyway, okay, we will come at that in another way. What was the cause of all this? What was the cause of the separation between Jews and Gentiles? What was the cause of their having a form of godliness without the power? What was the matter with the disciples of, with Jesus at, at Samaria? Enmity, enmity, sin, self. But enmity, sin, self is all self. It was the putting of self in the place of God that not only perverted God's appointed services and forms of service, but added to these a whole mountain of ceremonies and additions of their own, as we have read, right? So here he's getting more at the heart of what I think it's about, though I still think he's getting caught up on that term of the commandments contained in ordinances. But anyway, um, but definitely this is part of it. Man tries to find his own way to fulfill the law. Um, what was the object of it all? What were they doing all this for? To be saved, to be righteous. But there is no form or ceremony that even God himself appointed that can save a man. That is where they missed it. That is where thousands of people still miss it. And that is the form of godliness without the power. And that is ceremonialism. Now, really, it's legalism, right? And if you will receive it, that is the ceremonial law that was abolished by the abolishing of his flesh, in his flesh, the enmity, and so breaking down the middle law of partition. And I just don't think, so he's saying the ceremonial law that's destroyed is the one that we do it in our own power, right? So it's a form of godliness without the power, that's what he's saying. But I don't think that's what the text is saying, but, but he's applying it correctly in the sense that he's got the right idea. But I just would interpret the, the verse differently. But anyway, he, you can see that this is true, what he's saying, even if he's wrong about ceremonialism in, in the context of that verse, what it's being talked about. Anyway, it was the lack of presence of Jesus Christ and the heart by living faith that caused them to put their trust in these other things for salvation. Not having Christ for salvation, they did these other things that by these, they might be righteous, and thus they took the means which God had appointed for other purposes. They took the Ten Commandments, right? And here they, you can even put the Ten Commandments in there, right? So obviously the Ten Commandments aren't abolished or taken out of the way. They took circumcision. They took sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin. They took all these which God had given for another purpose and used them to obtain salvation by them, used them to obtain righteousness by the performance of them. But they could not find righteousness by the doing of these things. They could not find peace. They could not find satisfaction of heart because it was not there. They couldn't have their conscience cleansed from dead works. It was all of themselves, therefore, in order to be certain of it. They had to draw out these things which God had appointed and things which he had said into thousand hair-splitting and Cause, causistic, causistic distinctions that they could be so certain to come directly at the exact line that they could be sure that they had the righteousness they were after. And all these things did not satisfy. They did not find peace of heart yet. And consequently, they had to add a great many things of their own invention. And all these were their own invention anyhow. It was all ceremonialism from beginning to end. It's all legalism. And it was all done by that by these they might become righteous. But nothing but 
But nothing but faith in Christ Jesus can make a man righteous. Nothing but that can keep him righteous. But they did not have that. They did not have him abiding in the heart by living faith so that his virtue itself would shine out in the life through these things that God had appointed, which Christ himself appointed for that purpose. And therefore, when they attempted by these things, simply the expression of their own selves working out thus, to obtain righteousness, they missed real righteousness. And thus, that self in them built up this, that the testimony calls so often middle wall, the wall of partition, senseless exactions, hedging about, using the expressions over and over again in almost every conceivable way. Now, now the thing is, we know that there is this middle wall of partition, and, and Jones has shown that that's between man and God, and that if we remove the middle wall of partition between man and God, Jew and Gentile can be united, that we can make of one man, right? We can make, we can bring Jews and Gentiles that are now separated. They're separated because, because of sin, and because of the different ways in which the Jews have um, excluded the Gentiles because of their self-righteousness. Part of their self-righteousness was to separate themselves from what they considered to be the unrighteous. Now, today, we don't really have Jews and Gentiles. But we have people who look at someone else as a sinner and separate themselves from that other person. They're critical of their brother in Christ because that brother doesn't express themselves in a certain way or he doesn't eat the way they think he should or he doesn't dress the way they think he should or he doesn't believe the correct things he disagrees with him on some point of doctrine or they just don't like his his mannerisms how he speaks um what he talks about and and so they have some criticism of this person and and we can stand in judgment of that person we can say, well, that person's worldly, right? I'm not going to have anything to do with that person. And we cut that person off from Christ. That is, we have an opportunity to witness to that person, to help them. But instead, we put up a middle wall of partition between us and them. Because there's a middle wall of partition between us and Christ. So he says, Jones, what caused that wall to be built up? Did God build it up? No. Who did they, who did build it up? They themselves. And what was it in them that was the foundation of the whole thing? Self. And that self, as we have studied so often, is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And we read, and we read that the disciples felt that in order to prove themselves loyal to their nationality, it was incumbent upon them to cherish enmity towards the Samaritans. Do we think that it's incumbent upon us to consider ourselves righteous, to cherish enmity towards those with whom we differ, with those who are sinners, with the church, people in the church, people in the world? You know, sometimes we're actually much more receptive and lenient towards people in the world and accepting of them than we are people in the church, than we are brothers and sisters in this movement. That enmity we cherish and we think of it as some sign of our righteousness, that we are better than them. But we're just caught in the same trap that the Jews were in the time of Christ. Now, he says to acquire it, oh, no, but to cherish it, to hold fast to it. They cherish that enmity. It is the thing that we hold that makes us feel we are better than others, that we are somehow righteous because we believe or do something that other people don't believe or do. So Jones goes on, he says, then as that enmity, which is simply the expression of self, is that which caused all this wall to be built up. When Jesus Christ wanted to break down the wall and destroy it, annihilate it, what was the only way effectually to do it? It is the way to break down a wall, a building to begin at the top and to take off a layer of stone here and there and another 
or to begin in the middle and take out a stone here and there and another. No. If you want to break down the whole thing, you take away the foundation of the thing and the thing is done. The wall is destroyed. The building is torn down. Jesus Christ wanted to abolish the whole thing. He wanted to break down that wall absolutely and leave it in ruins. Therefore, he struck at the foundation of the thing. And as the spring, the foundation of the whole senseless wall was this enmity. Jesus broke down the wall by having abolished in himself, in his flesh, the enmity. And along with that, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, uh, Mr. Gilbert. Now, I, I don't know uh, who this is. I don't know if this is um, the Jewish Gilbert. But anyway, he says, that word righteousness itself has become perverted. So now the meaning of the word righteousness is that a man gives alms. That is, a man that gives a certain amount of alms has obtained righteousness. Uh, yeah, so it is his brother Gilbert. Um, what's his first name? Um Anybody remember? It says, Brother Gilbert, who was born a Hebrew and a Jew indeed now, says that the same idea still prevails among the Jews, that the word righteousness, and it's F. F. C. Gilbert. I can't remember what his first name is. Anyway, I have some of his books. Or my nephew does now. Uh, I used to have them. That word righteousness and the idea of righteousness itself has been perverted, and that now it means simply that which they receive as the consequences of that which they have done in giving alms or whatsoever it may be in the way of doing of right doing that's righteousness giving alms it is all righteousness by works righteousness by deeds without jesus christ it is all ceremonialism or legalism and it is just as bad for seventh day adventists today as for any pharisee in judea 1800 years ago all have it who have the profession of Christianity without Christ, who have the form of godliness without the power. It is only the fruit of the enmity, that is all. Whenever, wherever, you have the enmity, you will have ceremonialism. You cannot get rid of the thing without getting rid of the enmity. And as certainly as that enmity is there, it will show itself. In some places, it shows itself in what is called a color line. In other places, it shows itself in national lines, a German line, a Scandinavian line, etc., etc., so that when fully developed, there would be as many lines in the third angel's message as there are nationalities and colors on the earth. But in Jesus Christ, no such thing can ever be. And if we are not in Jesus Christ, we are not in the third angel's message. In Jesus Christ, the enmity is abolished, and consequently, in him, there is no color line. There's no Scandinavian line. There's no German line or any other kind of line. There's neither white nor black, neither Germans, nor French, nor Scandinavians, nor English, nor anything else. But Jesus Christ manifests upon all and through all and in you all. But we will never find that out. Even Seventh-day Adventists will not certainly find it out until that enmity is abolished by the living faith in Jesus Christ that surrenders the will to him to receive that living divine image of which we heard in Brother Prescott's lesson tonight. That is where we are. And this is present truth today and for Seventh-day Adventists as well as for other people. Oh, it is still the same cry. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. Here's another word right upon that. It tells the whole story on both sides. At that time, the Israelites had come to regard the sacrificial service as having in itself virtue to atone for sin, and thus had lost sight of Christ, to whom it pointed. God would teach them that all their services were as valueless in themselves as that serpent of brass, but were, like that, to lead their minds to Christ, the great sin offering, whether for the leading of their wound, the healing of their wounds, or the pardoning, the pardon of sin. They could do nothing for themselves but to manifest their faith in the remedy, remedy which God had provided. They were to look and live. Now see the present truth. There are thousands of Christians, thousands in the Christian age, who have fallen into an error similar to that of the Jewish people. They feel that they must depend on their obedience to the law of God to recommend them to his favor. 
Who have fallen into that similar error with the Jews? Those who feel that they must depend upon their obedience to the law of God to recommend them to his favor. Is that you? Have you ever seen anybody like that any time in your life? Thank God that he has broken down the middle wall of partition. The nature and importance of faith have been lost sight of. This is why it is so hard for many to believe in Christ as their personal savior. It is the same determined drawing of that enmity that will not let go until it is crucified, dead and buried with Jesus Christ. It is that that draws and draws. Oh, I must do something. I'm not good enough for God to like me. He's not good enough to care for one as bad as I, which is an interesting thought that God is not good enough to care for somebody as bad as I. That's a very strange idea of God. I must do something to pave the way. I must do something to break down the barriers that are between him and me and make myself good enough so that he can take favorable notice of me. Therefore, I must and I will keep the Ten Commandments. I will sign a contract and enter into a bargain to do it. And then you try to do it as hard as you can. Here's the passage passage from Farrar's Life of Paul, page 40, that I will read. The Jewish priests had imagined and had directed that if a man did not feel inclined to do this or that, that he should force himself to do it by a direct vow. Precisely. And so if you do not have it in your heart to do it, why? You must do it anyhow. Because it is right and you want to do right. And so you will sign the covenant, take a vow. Oh, well, now I've signed the covenant. Of course, I must do it. I have no pleasure in it. It is a galling yoke. But I've signed the covenant and I must keep the pledge, of course. That is ceremonialism. And it springs from the enmity, which is self. There are thousands in the Christian age who have fallen into an error similar to that of the Jewish people. They feel that they must depend on their obedience to the law of God to recommend to them to his favor. The nature and importance of faith have been lost sight of, and this is why it is so hard for many to believe in Christ as their personal savior. When Christ is believed in as your personal savior, when true faith lives and reigns in your heart, You need no vows to force yourself to do this or that. No, but the heart will always gladly exclaim, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. But Jesus Christ has broken down that middle wall of partition. He has abolished in his flesh that enmity that would fight against faith and keep man away from God. He has abolished that enmity that would keep man away from Christ that would put something else, everything else, in place of Christ, and that causes men to depend upon anything and everything under the sun for salvation, everything but Jesus Christ. Whereas nothing, nothing under the sun in heaven or earth, nor anywhere else can save, but simply Jesus Christ and faith in him. That is the only thing that saves. And if anyone expects to be saved by what he calls faith in Christ and something else, It is still the same old ceremonialism. It is still the working of the enmity. Men are not saved by faith in Christ and something else. Some may think that it is too strong. And perhaps I would better read the rest of that sentence. When they are bidden to look to Jesus by faith and believe that without any good works of their own, he saves them solely through the merits of his atoning sacrifice. Many are ready to doubt the question. They exclaim with Nicodemus, how can these things be? Yet nothing is more plainly taught in the scriptures than that, that then Christ, uh, then Christ, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Man has nothing to present as an atonement, nothing to render to divine justice on which The law has not a claim. If we were able to obey the law perfectly from this time forward, this could not atone for past transgression. The law claims from a man entire obedience through the whole period of his life. Hence, it is impossible for him by future obedience to atone for even one sin. Without the grace of Christ to renew the heart, we cannot render obedience to the law of God. Our hearts Are our nature evil? And how then can they bring forth that which is good? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. 
Job 14.4. All that man can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. Therefore, he who is trying to reach heaven by his own works and keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. True, man cannot be saved in disobedience, but his works should not be of himself. Christ must work in him to will and to do of his own good pleasure. If man could save himself by his own works, he might have something in himself in which to rejoice. But it is only through the grace of Christ that we can receive power to perform a righteous act. Many err or err in thinking that repentance is of such value as to atone for sin. But this cannot be. Repentance can in no sense be accepted as atonement. And furthermore, even repentance cannot possibly be exercised without the influence of the Spirit of God. Grace must be imparted. The atoning sacrifice must avail for man before he can repent. Um, <clears throat> the Apostle Peter declared concerning Christ, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, Acts 5.31. Repentance comes from Christ just as truly as does pardon. The sinner cannot take the first step in repentance without the help of Christ. Those whom God pardons, he first makes penitent. Nothing, nothing but faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Nothing but that saves the soul. And nothing but that keeps the soul saved. Now, I'm going to end there because there's still about 10 more pages. And we've already done an hour and I can't go that late. Um, so we're going to pick this up again next Friday. So any thoughts about what we've read? Now, that's asking a lot for people to just jump in. It's a lot of things to think about. And some of these things we've heard, of course, and we know. But I believe that these things can be striking us much more powerfully than they have in the past because of our past experience in this movement. You know, if we have seen ourselves as better than others, if we have judged others harshly and somehow felt that that means that we are are better than others then we are no different than the jews we're no different than the pharisee who says god i'm thankful i'm not like other people are I fast twice in the week pay tithes of all that i possess and i'm not like this publican but we will not be will not go down to our house justified only he that says god be merciful to me a sinner it's a very simple truth Sometimes it doesn't happen in our lives. So let's close with prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for each person, Lord, who has participated and uh, is studying these things. We pray that uh, these words from the past will be a blessing, that they will enter as seeds into our heart and that they will grow. And that our faith and trust in you and our lack of faith in ourselves uh, can occur. We can know that you are there for us. We pray for the work throughout the world, in Africa, and other places. We know, Lord, that um, a, lot, a lot is happening here in North America that is... Um, still to be seen what's going to result. So we ask, Lord, that you can help us to pray each day uh, for these things. Help us to study and to know what is truth for ourselves. Bless each person we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>